clueless because uh, because uh, he they actually don't have index cards. They don't have index cards, so they don't know which book to look at, which uh, uh, which uh, papyrus to like you know to follow. So like they actually know nothing instead of knowing everything. So that is kind of a similar situation. So we need a guidepost, something to guide us in this vast library of genomics. And for us, for uh, my laboratory, it is uh, the theory of evolution. So we actually use uh, evolution as a as a means to understand where to focus, how, you know, which one to prioritize, et cetera. And within this general uh, framework, so my um, uh, laboratory actually, um, my actually PhD is in anthropology, um, even though um, I graduated from a molecular biology department at Boazici, I did a PhD in anthropology and uh, did my postdoc in a medical school. And uh, my laboratory kind of reflects that uh, career where um, I actually look at, you know, some of the cultural changes in human history, uh, the genomics, especially medical genomics, and uh, using functional and molecular biology models uh, to really understand exactly what's going on with regards to um, understanding uh, how genotype, the genetic variation, translate into biological variation. Um, and overall, like, you know, we really look at, um, you know, epidemiology, functional genetic anthropology and publish on all these fronts. We try to kind of um, find places where these kind of different fields integrates to each other uh, with the hopes that we can actually have better answers to questions about humanity. Okay, do you have any questions so far, guys? Or everything has been clear? Okay, so I'm going to continue. So now one of the things that we figure out, guys, is uh, diet, what we eat, has been a major um, has been a major influencer of human evolution. It, it influences not only our metabolism and you know how we actually live our lives, but um, I will show you some examples how diet, and what we eat actually changed our genomes as well. So the one of the questions becomes is that how have changes in our diets affected our genomes, like I said. And one of the things, because, okay, let me actually take a step back. The reason why we're interested, like what we ate changed so much because our chimpanzee um, or great ape ancestors probably have a very different diet, more similar to uh, what chimpanzees are eating, for example, than us. They did not have, uh, they were not eating starch, which is like what you have in bread or uh, rice. Uh, they probably did not eat that much meat uh, and they did not eat that much nuts. So there's a lot of like, you know, differences in um, our diet. And the question is that um, how these changes in our diets affected our genomes? Um, and one of the obvious thing is taste and olfactory receptors. So uh, these are actually receptors in our tongues, in our like mouth, um, and in our noses that helps us to taste, um, you know, different uh, foods or smell um, different things, both like you know nice smells and bad smells. And one of the big things that uh, we actually published on is there are smells that some of us can smell and some of us don't. For example, people who domesticated pork early on, cultures who domesticated pork early on, actually ends up, uh, lo um, ends up losing one particular receptor that um, can actually sense um, boar testosterone, like male pig testosterone, which actually uh, smells pretty bad for those people. So like, you know, then um, it kind of makes sense because then you won't be able to eat pork and you don't want to basically be in a situation where you're evolutionarily, you're, there's a food source, but you cannot eat it. Um, it. With the same regard, we actually hypothesize that maybe going into agriculture because we actually change our diet so much may actually change uh, the repertoire 
of the olfactory and taste receptors receptors that we had. This is a collaboration with University of Calgary with Amanda. And uh, what we actually did is that we collected sample from Uganda. And these are hunter gatherers and um, farmers and also from Philippines. This is also hunter gatherers and um, uh, hunter gatherers and farmers. And the hypothesis was all like, okay, like maybe if you look at functioning olfactory receptors and taste receptors, maybe we'll see a difference between the farmers and the uh, farmers and the hunter gatherers. However, what we actually found is that there are some differences between Uganda and Philippines, probably just because they were separated a little bit uh, in their history. But uh, when we look at the functional ones, which are the gray ones and the non-functional ones, which are like the colorful ones, uh, you can see that the um, the hunter gatherers uh, and farmers, which are actually uh, in yellow and uh, orange, seems very similar to each other. So that we didn't actually find any major differences. So that was out of the question. What we found, though, that there's a lot of variation among us. So when uh, if uh, you have a friend who actually um, claims that um, you know she can taste a particular nutty flavor in the food that uh, they're eating, she may not be exaggerating. Maybe she actually does uh, taste that. Uh, it's just that you know some of us are better than others, but uh, it doesn't seem to have a major, uh, agriculture doesn't seem to be have a major impact on that. Um, so um, this variation also like, you know, uh, may indicate this whole variation uh, in receptors may indicate what we actually eat. Like, you know, some, you know, I don't like okra, for example. So it is possible that uh, it is because my mom uh, made me eat okra bamya uh, when I was young. And now like, you know, I developed like a cultural, like psychological, like an aversion, or it is possible that I have like some taste receptors that make it a little bit less um, uh, appealing uh, to me. So it may be true for other uh, stuff. But I think uh, what we actually becomes um, important is that from a biological point of view, what you actually eat determines how fat you are, how energetic you are, uh, what kind of pathogens that you are actually um, uh, getting into your system. Is there any allergens that you actually expose yourself to that leads to inflammation? There's all these things that relates to what you actually put in your mouth. And to go into that issue, uh, we actually start looking into saliva because the idea in our minds, okay, you actually um, taste something, you put it something in your mouth and saliva is a place where all these proteins ends up, um, uh, ends up start processing what you put. If it is a pathogen, it's the first line of the defense. If it is diet, it is the first time you actually start perceiving and you know, giving some signals to your brain, oh, I'm eating, you know, why don't you actually pump a little bit more insulin so it's coming, for example. So these are important metabolic uh, immune system uh, related uh, implications for what's happening in your saliva. So uh, we actually published a paper last year um, because we wanted to ask um, which salivary glands, there are three salivary glands in our mouth, you can see that uh, my postdoc um, actually made a great uh, approximation of my head uh, here, but we have three um, uh, salivary glands, parotid, submandibular, uh, and sublingual glands. And we hypothesize that each of these glands evolved to specialize on a particular function, particular set of proteins to be secreted into saliva where everything is then uh, become like a whole mesh um, where the saliva is uh, produced. And we indeed found these particular proteins coming from parotid, sublingual, and submandibular, creating a particular, um, a particular group of proteins to be very active uh, in the saliva. So, so that was kind of cool. Uh, but the reason why this is important is that we, once we have this picture, we can actually ask what's happening in our closest relatives, like chimpanzees and others. And that's exactly what we did. And clearly, um, the uh, even just by looks of, of it, anthropologists already noted that um, primate saliva are very variable. Like, you know, if you basically took at 
um, a rhesus macaque's saliva, it looks like much more sticky. That's like kind of disgusting. Um, and um, there's obviously a difference even with the physical properties. So the question is that what is happening with the, uh, uh, with the actual molecular level proteins? And uh, to, we actually did a lot of experiments with primates and other mammals. And it is clear that mouse has a completely different salivary proteome than humans. Like, you know, of the big um, five, none of them actually exist in mouse. And it has some mouse specific proteins. And we think that this is mainly because their diet is so different. And we did that with um, great apes. Obviously, great apes have more similar uh, protein uh, in their saliva, but their the amounts are very different. When we have like certain type of emulase, for example, in our mouth to be very abundant, but not in chimpanzees and gorillas. So there's an amazing diversity, uh, much more so that because normally what you if you take if I kill somebody here and then take their liver. Uh, and do like some proteomics or, you know, or we don't have to kill them. Okay, like, you know, fine. We can just take uh, a, a sample, a biopsy or something and look at their uh, proteome, for example. Um, we expect this human proteome to be very similar in liver with say chimpanzee or with mouse. That's why we can use mouse as a model for human disease. But for saliva, the picture is different. It seems that there's so much more uh, diversity. And we really want to dig deeper into that. And one of the things clues comes from uh, this particular gene called amylase. Amylase is the gene that digests starch. And starch is potatoes, you know, cooked potatoes, pasta, which is like, you know, the makarna, um, you know, rice, bread. So uh, this is like an important uh, food source for humans. But remember, not for chimpanzees or orangutans, because there are no bakeries uh, in the rainforest of Africa. Like, you know, they don't actually eat starch very often, only occasionally in uh, some rotten fruits and stuff. So um, there was some amazing papers in the last um, 10 years or so showing that indeed uh, a picture like this, where humans have amazing number of uh, emulase genes. Um, amylase gene is copied not only you normally you should have like one haploid copy of the amylase gene like other genes but in humans we actually see up to 10 haploid copies and that was really interesting and people think that it is because of agriculture where we actually cultivate rice and potatoes and um, things so there's a this evolutionary expansion and adaptation to eating that kind of food however um, our work, um, uh, and then the idea here is that these one copy normally that exists in other mammals is in pancreas, and uh, the other copies are in the saliva. However, what we actually start finding is that, you know, when we start looking at the um, different saliva of different animals, we actually found, isn't this cute, by the way, this is actually our collaborators, um, um, uh, capturing deer mice, which is like pretty common in North America. Um, uh, we are getting saliva from like a bunch of uh, mammals and um, we were seeing amylase in their saliva as well. So it was puzzling, what is happening? And then uh, what we actually found um, after like 16, uh, 68 species, um, including wolves and lions and all sorts of like, you know, um, exotic animals, we actually found that the picture is much more complicated, that uh, we actually found that rats, mouse, pigs, dogs uh, are all human-like saliva, um, saliva, salivary amylase. And it is similar to humans. Um, the salivary amylase comes from additional duplications, the structural variants affecting this particular amylase cluster. Make sense? And uh, we further found uh, that these additional duplications actually follow, even in, within the primate lineage, uh, follow specific dietary trends. For example, uh, these guys, rhesus macaques, actually have um, additional duplications as compared to other monkeys. And these are the guys 
who actually put all these like you know very um, well developed fruits into their mouths, and that's they actually spend like you know a half a day just leaving there like you know, hanging out where like in their mouths, and uh, a lot of the digestion actually happens in their mouths, and that's one of the reasons why amylase in saliva uh, through gene duplications may be beneficial in these particular guys. But in in contrast. The, um, these guys, this particular group of animals, the colobus monkeys and uh, snub-nosed monkeys, these are, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, these are uh, old world monkeys. Um, they are separated from baboons and rhesus because they eat leaves. They're essentially ca primate cows. And uh, because they eat so little starch, they actually lost the gene copies, additional gene copies. So they don't have like salivary amylase in their mouth. Um, so, I'm not going to talk about this particular concept more, uh, but it is, uh, you know, we already published this paper in eLife. It's a really nice uh, paper, I think. But we actually found that this gene copy number, this structural variation, is such a rapid way of evolving the genomes that even dogs and wolves separate from themselves only 20,000 years ago. Wolves um, have nothing, and dogs have all, all these additional copies uh, evolved only in 10,000 years, 20,000 years having salivary amylase. And we think that it's not mostly about digestion, uh, but for perception. So when you actually, uh, so the idea I think like, you know, is here where, um, you know, I actually have a dog um, and the dog loves pasta and bread. Actually, it will prepare, uh, uh, prefer um, probably bread to uh, a steak. Like if you basically put, and this is kind of amazing because um, a dog is essentially a wolf. Like I am, my genome is um, much more distant to Eje uh, than a wolf to the, a dog. Like, you know, um, when you actually compare it uh, like that. So it is kind of amazing that how fast uh, this preference evolved. And we think that it is mainly because of this salivary amylase. And remember, we do have these differences among us about salivary amylase and the gene copy numbers. We are actually working on that now, which we think that uh, people who love bread, for example, is it's precisely they love bread because uh, they have these salivary amylase so they can digest bread much early on so they can give that um, signal to the brain earlier. Make sense? Okay, now I'm gonna switch gears guys and talk about another, um, um, another paper that we just published last month. Um, and this is about ancient variations and ancient uh, structural variations. So this is the paper. It's just published in uh, Science Advances. And this is about a deletion, not a gene duplication, but this time a deletion um, that we actually uh, share with Neanderthals and Denisovans. So we have been working on this. We actually say, um, can we find genetic variations that is so old that our ancestors before we separate from Neanderthals, already carrying them, that po like older population, maybe a Homo erectus populations, uh, were already carrying them. And we actually found a bunch of them. In fact, we actually found, for example, psoriasis, which is Sedef uh, hustle, may actually been with us a very long time uh, because there's a balance between Sedef and um, uh, protection against leprosy. Uh, but, um, I'm not gonna talk about that. I just wanna um, emphasize that when we actually, uh, this is a kind of a complicated graph, but um, let's start from the bottom. At the bottom, I'm actually showing um, phylogeny, a tree of our ancestors and ourselves. We have the Africans and Eurasian populations, and then we have separation of Neanderthals, which are in orange, and the Denisovan individual, which is this ancient uh, human, um, hominin, and we actually separated from them about 700,000 years ago. And before that, um, you know, it's kind of a muddy thing, but like probably we have some other populations like Homo erectus, which is ancestor to both uh, humans, but also to Neanderthals and Denisovans. And when we actually look at our genome, guys, most of our genetic variation can be traced back. If I basically collect DNA from all of us now and build phylogenies, it will probably go back to a population about 200,000 years ago in Africa. 
and we share like you know some more commonality maybe because we are all from turkey we're born uh, most of us were born in turkey or in western asia so like there's some uh commonalities um from groups that kind of lived maybe 10,000 20,000 years ago but it turns out there are still hundreds of genetic variations that goes all the way to 200,000 years and more to millions of years not many right like you know just proportionally it's not like you know all of our genomes are like that maybe only one or two percent of the, our genomes are like that but still our genomes are so big that there are still um uh, hundreds if not thousands of genetic variations that they predate um uh, with uh, predates this uh, time these purple guys and we actually find them these uh, categorizations are based on if we share genetic variation with Neanderthals and Denisovans. So the purple ones are we share because they're super old. And um, the orange ones are we share these uh, genetic variations because there's a recent introgression, some sort of sex happening between our, uh, between our more recent ancestors, maybe 30, 40,000 years ago, and the Neanderthal populations living then. But what I'm going to, this is Albert's, uh, my PhD student's work, by the way. Uh, by the way, nothing that I show you in this uh, presentation is my work. It's like all the students, I'm just talking about it, which is like the best kind of um, work. <laughs> so, the, uh, so the students do the work, I basically do the talking. But anyways, so um, among these really old variations, I'm gonna focus on one of them, uh, which is growth hormone receptor um, deletion. So the reason why we focus on this is that normally, if you have a housekeeping gene, meaning that if it is a, if a gene really important, you really don't want to mess around with it, right? Like you don't want to basically like poke it. Like, you know, it's not like a dietary salivary amylase, which is kind of, you know, if you don't taste like, you know, rice that well, it's not the end of the world. But if your growth hormone receptor is not working, well, you cannot grow. Your cells cannot divide. It's like a really... Uh, something that you don't want to touch unless you know what you're doing. Um, it's like, you know, you can, you want to, you know, you can change the, uh, the light bulb in your house, but you don't want to basically open up like the electric circuit of the entire house kind of a thing. So it is a central growth hormone receptor is a central gene um, and it leads to growth like cell division. And it is actually uh, connected to mTOR uh, P53 pathway um, you know, JAK2 pathway, if you're into molecular biology, you know these like pathways very well. So it's very central. So it's a really weird thing to have a deletion affecting this particular gene. In fact, when you look at it in another way, uh, when we look at mammals, um, you can see that um, it's an extremely conserved amino acid sequence for that particular gene, which kind of makes sense. Again, it's a housekeeping gene, it's conserved. However, it turns out that half of us and the Neanderthals and Denisovans actually miss this 20 uh, amino acids. Somehow it's variable. Some of us in this particular Zoom room um, are carrying a shorter version of growth hormone receptor. And that is really weird uh, from an evolutionary point of view. That's why we actually got really interested in this and try to understand. So um, uh, Maria, which was my postdoc at the time, now she left me and betrayed me and went on to become a faculty in Norway. And uh, I shouldn't say this because uh, you should be coming to my lab, but she's also looking for students, um, just uh, so you know. Um, but um, she asked the question, okay, uh, if this deletion has a benefit, like maybe it's actually uh, helping us in some way. That's the question that um, she asked. And we look at where the deletion is more co most common. It's common everywhere, but it's particularly common in Africa. So um, that was like first clue. And then there's some decrease in allele frequency in some portions of um, East Asia. So that was our kind of first clue that there's, there may be something else going on. And uh, we looked at it, I think I already told you that uh, some of us actually have that deletion and the Neanderthals and uh, uh, the Denisovan individual, these ancient guys, also have that shorter version of the uh, deletion. And we work with uh, Shigaki, who is at um, Dublin, and um, he's a wizard with um, a Bayesian um, computational like estimates of uh, selection. 
And you know, this kind of a complicated analysis, I don't want to go into the math of it, but the idea here is that we found that this based on this, um, the original, like, you know, the really, if you go a little bit um, older times, we think that Africa represents more uh, earlier version of the allele frequency, like maybe 75, 80%. But in Asia, there's a sudden decrease in allele frequency. And we mathematically show that indeed, it's only 30,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, um, the allele frequency in Asia was about 85% for the deletion, but it decreased very rapidly to uh, 15%. So there's like, you know, something going on um, either um, in some geographies, the deletion is good. Sometimes it's not good. So that's why like, it's kind of changing over time. The allele frequency is changing over time pretty rapidly. In fact, what we actually show um, that about uh, one and a half million years ago, this deletion evolved, emerged, probably in our Homo erectus ancestor um, uh, ancestors, go very high up in allele frequency very fast and become very, very high, maybe 90% allele frequency uh, in our ancestors for a long time. But only recently, we actually have this reduction in allele frequency in everywhere, including Africa, but most visibly in uh, Asia. However, our Neanderthals and Denisovans, they actually, have, all of them actually have the deletion. Does that make sense? So you have this, this weird oscillating thing uh, happening. So it, uh, this means that the deletion may be sometimes beneficial in certain conditions, and sometimes it's detrimental. Um, then uh, the question becomes why? Like, why would you have sometimes, you know, something that is, uh, if something's beneficial, it's beneficial. Sometimes it's not. What is going on? So Skyler actually did some experiments with this. And one of the things that we um, do is that we meta-analyze, meaning that we actually go back to the literature and the data sets, association data sets, where we actually look at uh, different associations with this uh, deletion. And it sort of turns out that uh, this deletion is associated with small birth size, small placenta size, size in, the, uh, in the mothers, earlier time to sexual maturation, that if you have the deletion, you become um, an adolescent, like sexually active much faster. Um, bone ossification, meaning that like you actually have stronger bone ossification in adult age and longevity, you actually live longer. That's kind of weird. Uh, but, you know, these are like almost unrelated set of um, stuff, which it is very hard to make sense of. However, the good news is that um, I read a lot. And because I read a lot, I actually came across um, an ecological, um, ecological literature, which is nothing to do with humans, but all everything to do with fish. And uh, people actually um, come up with an interesting idea where fish um, actually have this ability to compensatory growth. Under starvation conditions, the fish switch modes. And what happens is that they actually born small, they're much smaller when they're born, but they catch up faster. And this uh, phenotype, this trait is associated with generally like, you know, has consequences with longevity, life, you know, metabolic markers, age and sexual maturation, growth uh, rate, bone ossification, exactly the things that uh, this deletion is attached, associated with. And the main thing is that it confers starvation resistance so we are like okay like you know maybe this is actually about starvation and how you actually fare under if you don't have food and the way we test this is that we work with a malawi cohort these are individual kids um, that survived starvation you probably see all these documentaries pretty sad and it turns out, guys, maybe you actually remember this particular type of phenotype where you have like these kids that are like really skinny. You can count to like rib bones, but you they have like a big belly. And that is a sign of a particular type of metabolic disorder, as a re especially because of protein deficiency, 
where uh, this is accumulation of fluid that has major consequences. And starvation sometimes leads to that, but some kids are uh, more susceptible to that. And some of them are more protected after starvation. So we actually uh, work with Neil uh, from NIH uh, to get that cohort and genotype this particular deletion in them and show that if you have the deletion, indeed, you actually don't less likely to develop that particular pretty bad metabolic disorder uh, under starvation conditions, which uh, is a good evidence for, you know, this may actually be beneficial if you're starving the deletion. Make sense? Okay. So then uh, to really understand the mechanism, guys, what we did is uh, we actually use CRISPR. And remember, like this was a very conserved um, gene. So we basically take out that particular uh, deletion, that 20 amino acids uh, part from the mouse uh, in a laboratory mouse. It actually works like, you know, pretty well. And what we actually end up doing, because we want to uh, test for starvation and we want to understand what is happening, especially in liver and blood, uh, we created uh, eight cohorts, uh, which is normal wild type males and females, um, wild type uh, males and females, but under starvation conditions. And then uh, you have the deleted guys, homozygous the deleted guys with the same conditions, male, female, under normal diet and under uh, color restriction. And what we found is pretty amazing because um, normally mouse actually has sexual dimorphism growth, almost 50% difference between males and females in their size. And um, when you actually look at color restriction, that actually diminished a little bit, which is known. Uh, but under, if you have the homozygous D3, nothing really happens to the growth um, under normal conditions. But under starvation conditions, males become much, much smaller. And there's actually no difference between males and females uh, for the homozygously deleted mouse. So that was very interesting. So we really wanted to understand what's happening. And I'm not going to bore you because... It's an evolution talk and another uh, functional genetics or molecular biology talk. But um, if you're into feedback mechanisms, et cetera, it turns out that in males, you have this pulsating growth hormone secretion. That's one of the biggest things in mammals that separates the sexes biologically. You have growth hormone to be much more circadian uh, in males and much more flat in females. Um, and that leads to uh, normal sexual dimorphism. But um, if you have the deletion, if you have the shorter version of the growth hormone receptor, it kind of um, negates the pulsating um, function. You know, the signal is not as pulsating as it is, uh, but there's a feedback, ne um, negative feedback loop, oh, sorry, um, a feedback loop that actually ensures uh, that this is compensated and this is actually a circadian um, uh, rhythm. So we actually found that this is indeed creating uh, like rescuing under normal conditions, uh, this normal functioning of uh, growth hormone receptor, which leads to normal sexual dimorphism. But under color restriction, this, there's already a dampening of growth hormone secretion because of color restriction. Plus you have the effect of the small um, growth hormone receptor the deletion, together, it's not enough. There's not enough compensation, which leads to female-like growth hormone signaling, which leads to uh, the, the sexual, uh, no sexual dimorphism. And then it becomes uh, clear, I'm not gonna show you this because this is very new and this is a collaboration with the, uh, Holy Ingram, but it seems that this situation where the males are much smaller is really beneficial for starvation However, they make them vulnerable to infections. So like if there's no starvation, you really don't want to have the deletion because uh, then you can you die from um, infections. But if you're starving, uh, it doesn't matter if you're dying from uh, infection because that's a much more important threat. So it's kind of a balance 
between uh, making sure that you don't starve or like you survive starvation versus like, you know, um, having much more robust um, immune system. Make sense? So that's the general story. It is a pretty big story because it's one of the clearest examples in humans of sex and environment dependent effects of a common polymorphism. So this evolutionary like adaptation, it's not like, okay, you have, um, you know, being tall is always good or like, you know, being this or always good. It's either, you know, it's basically dependent, um, the fitness effects, the evolutionary benefits depend on your sex and depend on your uh, environment. And remember, one of the things that happened at 30,000 years when we see the decrease is a huge uh, change in culture, in human evolution, where we actually have more food, essentially. So starvation may not be as big of a problem anymore. And infections become much of an issue so that the deletion is not favorable anymore. Okay, so I will... Uh, close it with one of the things that is dear to me, guys. Uh, maybe you already heard uh, about this idea that Africa is the most genetically diverse place and that within population variation is much more important than across population uh, variation. So like the, this idea of ethnicities and races, etc., really does not have that much importance or meaning when you, if you're looking at genetics. So from a biological point of view, that's not a, it's not a big deal. And on top of that, my work actually, our work shows that a lot of the variation we share um, in our populations, like the, these um, variations, the growth hormone receptor deletion, for example, is not, not, a, not a Turkish thing, not an American thing, not an English thing. It's actually can be found in every single population. And that variation is our shared legacy all the way coming from a Homo erectus ancestor. So it is, I think, important to recognize how similar we are and how much of our, um, how uh, much commonality that we have, even in our variations. So with that, um, I want to basically conclude my talk. And if you have any questions, you let me know. And I'm always recruiting guys for uh, different projects. You can actually go to our website. If, especially if you're interested in applying for a um, PhD, uh, I think uh, Buffalo will be a good place for you. It's a little bit cold, but it's actually a nice place uh, to live and study. And, um, uh, and summer internships are a little bit tough because of COVID, stupid COVID. Uh, but um, if, if, if you're interested, uh, let's actually keep in touch and uh, let me know if you have any questions. I cannot like, you luckily AJ and Simge are actually have, uh, so I can see that somebody's listening. So I don't know what's happening with the other guys. Thank you so much Ajami, for your presentation. Uh, is there any question? Okay, I'm going to share the new 101 link. <clears throat> you can feel it. But actually I have some questions we talked about a dog who chooses a pasta um, from the meat we can change the saliva and it changes our diet chooses i can understand that but um if we change our like cups okay we take this in our man uh, mouth again if we use the carton, or if you use glass, or if you use plastic, can it be change our saliva, or can it be change our diet? That's that's a good question. So some people actually, but I don't know if it is biological or cultural. Like you know, there is um, people um, show, for example, that um, in really fancy restaurant with fancy uh, silverware, like you know, with fancy mm -hmm. stuff, people generally eat less, or uh, people apparently uh, people reported that something tastes better in a glass um, yeah, I know. a glass container than in a uh, in a plastic one for example so I think there's something to do with it but I do not know any biological reasons why that would be 
um, uh, you know, and it may be more cultural, but who knows? Maybe that is actually something to be 